Welcome to Vision Pros, the show all about spatial computing, Vision OS, and getting work done on the Apple Vision Pro. I'm Tim Chen, host of the show. And so this is kind of, I guess, the first opportunity to do something that's specific to, to Vision OS, where you, rather than just having a, a fixed rectangular screen, you've got, you know, your room uh, to place things. And so, yeah, you can start a timer and then drag it um, to wherever you want. Maybe you just put them on the bench, but it's kind of nice if you, you know, you could position them uh, next to the food that's actually cooking, so over the pot or over the oven. Then if you've got a few going, it's easy to sort of keep track of what relates to what and saves you then entering uh, manually like a name for each timer because you can just see where it's sitting. Hello there, and welcome to another episode of Vision Pros. On this episode is Devin, the developer behind the awesome recipe organizer and meal planning app Crouton. He's already hard at work at adapting his iPad version of the app to Vision OS and discovering some cool concepts like floating timers that you can place on the item you're cooking. Learn more about his awesome app at www.crouton.app and download it today in the App Store. As a reminder, you can support this podcast and the iPad Pros podcast by heading over to patreon.com slash iPad Pros and supporting for as little as a dollar a month. Every dollar is greatly, greatly appreciated. It goes a long way with the production of this show. You can also subscribe in Apple Podcasts. Subscribing to either Vision Pros or iPad Pros will get you early access to both podcasts. With that said, here's my discussion with Devin. Enjoy. Welcome to the podcast, Devin. Hey, thanks for having me. Absolutely. So you're going to be one of the very first guests on Vision Pros. I'm very excited for this new show as we lead up to the launch next year at some point of this exciting new platform with Vision OS and the Vision Pro. Yeah, looking forward to it. Yeah. So um, first off, can you just introduce yourself a bit, your background? How did you get into development and um, I guess leading into, uh, you know, what inspired you to create your first, or I'm not sure if it's your first app, your, your app you're working on now, Crouton. Sure. Uh, so initially I was quite interested in graphic design, sort of going through high school. I thought maybe that was what I wanted to do. Uh, but my dad was a software developer and so I'd always sort of been interested in technology through him and in New Zealand where I'm from at least graphic design is a little bit of a harder field uh, to get into but plenty of software jobs and so uh, he pointed out there's sort of an opportunity to mesh those together with UX and UI and those things and so ended up doing a computer science degree and that's where I learned how to write code and from there I got a job in iOS development once I mm-hmm. finished my degree and so that sort of then was where I learned the skills of iOS development um, through the day job and then sort of enjoyed it so much that in the evenings it was like, oh, maybe I you know, could build something for myself, yeah. solve a few of my own problems, uh, which is where I, the idea from Crouton came from. Very cool. How far along was iOS when you did get that first job? Um, how, how much of the evolution have you seen it as a developer? Uh, in terms of when I started development, I think... We were on, it was probably iOS 12, so pretty yeah. late in the piece. Um, yeah. But I've been following Apple since forever, so I've always sort of been you know, keeping an eye on what's new and, and things like that. So, But it wasn't until about around iOS 12 that I actually jumped in and started gotcha. learning very cool. my own apps. Yeah, very cool. So uh, tell me a bit about Crouton. Um, what is it? Who's it for? Um, do you have any kind of features in Crouton that you kind of use and like kind of make you smile? It's like, oh, I'm really glad I got that right. Uh, yeah, so as I said, it's sort of looking at how I could solve my own problems. And uh, one thing that my wife and I started doing when we got married was meal planning um, at the start of each week, just using recipes that we liked and putting them on each day just to help with groceries and budgeting and things. And to start with, I was using a note in the notes app just to kind of list out the days of the week. And then underneath that, I had links to all the different recipes um, that we liked. And so at the start of each week, I'd just copy and paste them to the top of the note. Yeah. Uh, And it worked pretty well for a while, but obviously, you know, as you add more recipes, that gets out of hand. Yeah. And so saw an opportunity there to try and make something. A lot of the apps that I looked at at the time were either pretty focused on like the health side of meal planning Mm -hmm. rather than just the the budgeting of just picking some recipes. Right. Uh, And I also just was keen to sort of, yeah, try build something myself. And so that's sort of where I, I got started on Crouton and then it's, eventually been fleshed out to be more than just a meal planner and hopefully just a, a great recipe manager in general. 
Very cool. Yeah, the meal plannings are evident as you use the apps. Like, oh, this is more than just recipes. This is like, let me plan out my week. And yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's sort of, that's why when you open Crouton, the first tab is the meal plan. I think definitely there's people that would prefer that it isn't. And yeah, I've got plans to change that, but that's because that's the, sort of the origins of it. And I think, I also think when you open an app, you want the most relevant glanceable information to be available first. And so if you open the app and you see the meal plan, that's usable information. Whereas if you just see a list of recipes, you don't really care alphabetically which recipe, you know, yeah. shows up first. So, and is um, it right? Does it integrate with health? Like you can use those recipes to feed into like uh, food tracking in the health app. Uh, that's not currently supported, okay. um, but it is on, on my roadmap to sort of okay. flesh out that side of things a bit more. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I thought I saw it somewhere, but yeah, probably maybe one of the different apps I was researching there. Um, one cool thing would be to say, I've got these ingredients in the house. Here's my, uh, database of different, uh, recipes in my app. Um, what can I make? Is that something on the radar as well as a, a potential future? Yeah. I think about that one quite a bit. Uh, I do get requests for sort of pantry management. Yeah. I think one of the, the challenges there is the sort of manual process of keeping it up to date and making sure that you've got the right information. So you're not getting suggested recipes for an ingredient you used up <laughs> yeah. a week ago and sort of forgot to, to right. um, keep up to date or scan in. Um, so I think there's sort of a, a challenge to crack there. But if I did that, then definitely a great option. And I think as well with, with GPT and things like that, even recipes that you don't currently have in the app, if I can say, you know, I've got these food, this in the pantry. What's a, what's a good recipe that I don't know about that I could cook? Yeah, you can so even, definitely uh, yeah, specify cuisine and all that. Um, so um, let's jump over to the Vision Pro. Um, and we're gonna, we'll go back to Crouton in a bit here. Is it, am I uh, right that you were actually in Cupertino for this announcement? Yeah, yeah. It was, a, it was my first uh, WWDC, but it was definitely uh, a really good one to yes, be there in person for. That is a great one to be there for the first time. Uh, were you there um, from work capacity, uh, day job capacity, or as an indie developer capacity, or a little bit of both? Uh, I guess a little bit of both. I mean, iOS development is my day job, so there's definitely crossover between indie and and, and that. So, um, But also just, uh, as I said earlier, it's something I've been keeping up with uh, as long as I can remember. So just always sort of wanted to make it over there and finally uh, got a ticket and that's awesome. everything came together. Yeah, that's a little bit of a trip for you, um, but well worth yeah, it. <laughs> yeah, a few hours on the plane, but yeah. yeah. Yeah, I imagine having a Vision Pro on the plane would have been, been nice to pass the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe next time I make it over, I'll be able to wear one. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so when they got to the Vision Pro part of the, the keynote, you know, an hour in or so, um, and they were introducing this as not just like an entertainment device, but this new spatial computing operating system. What was your reaction when, when you heard about this kind of pitch for this new computing platform versus just something for movies and games and stuff? Yeah, I thought it was pretty exciting. I really have been thinking about it. I think the term spatial computing is a really good one. I'm not, I'm not sure if it's something Apple's coined, but I don't know that I'd heard it before the keynote, but it felt like a really good reframing of, We've always just sort of been talking about AR and VR. Yeah. And spatial computing really does make it feel like the next step in terms of the evolution of technology. And I think sort of gives it more breadth than just like an AR experience. It's like this is maybe how most of our computing is going to happen going forward. And I think they, from my perspective, did a great job of, of presenting that in the keynote. Yeah, it really did feel like this is the future and you can live in it next year for, you know, uh, this first headset and it'll just improve from here. Totally. Yeah. Um, what about this first generation are you most excited about? What kind of situations do you see yourself using it and, uh, you know, developing within this? Is it something that, you know, you have Xcode and on the Mac screen within Vision Pro that you can like live test your code in the Vision Pro instance of the app or even mistake me if I'm wrong, but I think you can even run like iPhone apps within Vision Pro. I'm not sure if Xcode will let you, you know, run that as a simulator within there and if that would be a good enough environment or if you'd want to be touching, you know, an iPhone with the, the app running to do that kind of stuff. Yeah, I think the the, the, the thing I'm possibly the most interested in is uh, I love sitting on the couch. <laughs> and yeah. so being able to have a, a close to desktop experience on the couch with like multiple displays and, and things like that is 
quite a compelling <laughs> use case for me. And I think definitely the, I'm not sure exactly how it works in terms of where the simulator appears when you run it, but being able to sort of see your Mac and then run the simulator, especially if you're building a, a Vision OS app, you can mm-hmm. run it from your Mac through the headset and then see the app appear sort of next to you in yeah. the virtual space. So I think that's going to be a great thing just from an efficiency perspective of not sort of jumping between different devices. You know, it's all just there in front of you. Yeah, the ergonomics are actually interesting because like, you know, if you're on a couch with a laptop or even at a desk with a, just a laptop that's not propped up on a stand, you're hunching over. This in many ways ergonomically could be actually a benefit. You're, you're looking straight ahead with maybe good posture, hopefully, and you're just either using a keyboard well positioned or just the eye tracking with the finger tapping. And um, you're able to use this computer in some situations that would be difficult to um, you know, say a dog's trying to like cuddle you on, on your chest and it's kind of hard <laughs> to put a laptop there, <laughs> stuff like that, you know. That's true. Yeah. Or, or even standing desks. You don't even need to raise the desk up. You can just stand wherever you want. Yeah. Yeah. We, and then you'll get um, a lanyard for your keyboard that can just be in front of you as like a little uh, <laughs> neck strap, a little lightweight keyboard. That's right. right? Yeah. <laughs> That's going to be a whole market of like attaching uh, keyboards to to people. That, that'll be a strong look in the office, <laughs> right? Yeah. Oh gosh. Um, and then I was also thinking about outside. A lot of times, it, it's difficult to use computers outside because of the sunlight. As long as it's, as long as the device doesn't get too warm and overheats, if it can stay cool enough outside, you could actually probably see your screen much better in here than in on a laptop, for instance, which doesn't get too bright and this will block out all the sunlight because you'll be in the headset. Yeah, that's true. I am curious about uh, what it's like to use outside. Like I noticed in the simulator, all of the uh, simulated environments are are indoors. Yeah. Uh, So I wonder if they're sort of not really, you know, encouraging encouraging people to use it outside at this stage. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to know what what it is like. Yeah, I'd imagine rain would be an issue, so you have to be careful there. (laughs) And then, yeah, the other concern is in summer, or you know, New Zealand. I imagine it gets warm. Um, uh, is it is it warm all year round? I'm kind of not quite sure on that. Uh, where I'm at in Christchurch, we have pretty warm summers uh, and then reasonably cold winters. Okay, uh, so you do have the the full yeah. season. So fall and spring might be a, a good time to use this thing outside. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. Yeah, I imagine summer might overheat. Like your iPhone gives you a warning. <laughs> like, too hot except really floating in front of you giant <laughs> exactly morning yeah. temperature yep uh so um long long term do you see this replacing a mac potentially i know there are rumors even of mac apps running in this thing natively or uh, do you see pretty op- yeah or do you see that there will always be you know a laptop form factor in addition to this and just changing of different uh environments i guess yeah i think at this stage i'm pretty optimistic about that sort of path. I mean, it has an M2 chip in it, so uh, Visual yeah. One's going to be as powerful as my current MacBook, which runs all these applications. So right. I don't see why there isn't a path where you don't even need to share screens with your Mac anymore because all your applications are just on the headset. Uh, I guess you've got things like maybe storage and, and RAM upgrades. We don't know too much about that from the headset, uh, which they can pack into a laptop. But yeah, uh, yeah. That's that's my curious uh, curiosity. Is it says starting at thirty four ninety nine? Is that a purely the storage question? Like, are we gonna have the same exact tiers as like an iPad, and you have to pay four hundred dollars more for the extra, you know, storage or whatever it is? And, yeah, I imagine you can spec it up pretty high. Well, and, and also like I wear glasses, so the the prescription thing as well. It's sort of going to be interesting to see how much that costs as an extra add on. Yeah, and I'm curious about the third parties with the prescription thing because. There's a thriving market of VR lens manufacturers, and those I'm sure will be much less expensive than Zeiss. Um, and and there are there are magnets built into the headset, which makes it really easy for other manufacturers to potentially piggyback off of. Um, so I'm curious on how that market will go. I will probably want to opt for the fancy Zeiss ones because it'll just be probably nicer um, being the first party solution. Yeah, yeah. There might also be an uptick in uh, like LASIK and, and contact lenses <laughs> over the next year or so, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I don't want to share thoughts on the, that stuff, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, generally, I think uh, the lenses are probably th- the better, you know, the, the attachments is probably a better way to go and not excessive as LASIK. And once you're in the headset, you can see crystal clear and then take them off here. 
in your normal vision and that's uh, right less dry eyes and stuff and I, you know contacts are great for um especially outdoors and sporting and usage but i know a lot of people have issues with contacts for computer usage and like staring at screens it's it's less great at, at that i believe but um right yeah might not be a good option then yeah yeah but so you know people make their own decisions on that stuff i'm sure um as far as the form factor this is as big as it's going to get uh and it's only going to get thinner and lighter from here but what do you think about uh these ski goggles and um <laughs> this is something um potentially wearing for multiple hours for you know a full full day of work with perhaps you know you of course take breaks as you do for lunch and whatnot but yeah i guess it's hard to hard to know what it's gonna be like to wear it for an extended period of time at the moment i think it definitely makes which i'm sure we'll get into for some of like the crouton use cases i think version one may not be something you want to wear in the kitchen but as this is yeah uh, the first gen, they're all probably going to run Vision OS. The same application that runs on this first version is going to run on generation five, six, seven, where yeah. it might actually start to be something you just wear right. during your daily tasks. And and so, I think for a first version, it, it seems seems really great. And uh, pr- like in terms, of, yeah, Gen One products, this seems like a really refined starting point. So I'm kind of just excited to see. Yeah, it seems like the go. the baseline is just so high on this. Like they had to hit a certain standard of performance optically and, you know, um, response wise for tracking. And that's why, where the price comes from, but, uh, they got it that it's a pro version to start cause they needed that baseline experience going forward. Otherwise it just won't be a viable platform. And, um, that's exciting, but this is the worst it'll ever be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Like if you look at the Apple watch series zero, that was sort of a much different sort of starting point Yeah, to, to what this product is. Yeah, it's it's funny with the Apple Watch. They felt that was an okay starting point, which did not last very long. But I mean, it did what it needed to do to get the platform started. I, you know, same with the iPhone and iPad. But this one, it, it's just so much higher spec because it just has to be. Yeah, um, different, yeah. different goals and expectations. Yeah. So uh, we had the SDK out now, along with the simulator, and that's uh, an exciting thing because we're able to actually interact with Vision OS through the Mac uh, in this way. Um, how much of a sense can you get interacting with the simulator of how it'll be interacting with the OS, like dragging windows around and, um, interacting with the OS from multitasking perspectives and, and, and whatnot? Yeah, I've been pretty Im- impressed with the simulator overall. Obviously with the, the real device, all of it is sort of gestural based with your hands and your eyes. And so that has to be converted into using your, your cursor and trackpad and things to move around. So it definitely makes it a bit awkward, but I think using the simulator and moving things around feels sort of compelling, even just in the simulator that makes me think, you know, when it's the real device, it's going to be just so, so much better. So it gives you like kind of a taste of how good it's going to be yeah. just, um, just from using the simulator. And have you um, kind of tested like the window limit? I know Crouton, ha- you're able to use a lot of windows within Crouton. But, uh, you know, is there a maximum that just, like, doesn't let you put up, like, say you have 20 windows open? Does it start uh, warning you at that point? Uh, I actually haven't tried that yet. I'm not sure what the, what the max limit is, but I've, I've definitely done, like, you know, four or five, and it's it's been fine with, with that. Okay. So you've hit more than four. That's that's encouraging because yeah, Sage Manager yeah, yeah, on yeah. iPad <laughs> is only four. So uh, that would be a rather uh, big limitation if that was uh, imposed there. And... As far as the system apps that are in there, how much have you played around with Safari and any interesting things in the settings app worth pointing out? Uh, yeah, at the moment, the, it's pretty limited in terms limited in terms of the vision specific apps. Mm-hmm. Um, so I've sort of played with them because I've been trying to get, you know, one thing that's great with iOS is there's so many system apps you can draw a lot of inspiration for for how Apple would solve yeah. certain problems and how to be a good um, citizen on the platform. I think. With Vision OS, it's a little hard at the moment because there's only sort of like freeform Safari and the settings app and and photos. I might have missed one there that that are system apps, and those are kind mm-hmm. of uh, quite light experiences. And so you, yeah, I've played with them to try and get a sense of okay, what what should Crouton look like on this platform? But yeah, it'll be nice as as we get more of those apps to sort of get a better sense of um, you know how Apple see this platform developing. Obviously, they have the style guides that they put out in the human interface guidelines but 
it's not until you can actually play with the applications and see how things move around that you get a, a good sense of of the platform. Does the settings app um, resize fully, or is it like the iPad where it has these <laughs> these stuck size uh, the stuck size of just a big window? I'm pretty sure when I tested it, you couldn't resize settings. Of course, you can resize the other apps. Yeah, yeah so. that's amazing. Yeah, I think the Mac's the same way, where it's just like stuck at a certain size. I'm sure they've they've tested that with users to find the perfect oh, window sure. size for settings. I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anything uh, surprising uh, within the simulator that you've you know noticed so far? I don't know if anything's been too surprising. Just just pleased with uh, with how sort of well fleshed out the developer story is for it and yeah. how easy it is to sort of get things up and running and start trying to get a sense of, of the platform. Um, so yeah, mm-hmm. I think they've just done a good job of, of building that out from the get-go. Yeah, you must be really pleased that they did include a virtual kitchen for you to be testing in. Uh, that'd be yeah, a little bit yeah, more difficult otherwise. <laughs> it's perfect. I just wish there was a few more like appliances or like a <laughs> right. bench a bit messier. Yeah, yeah. Uh, any design considerations uh, bring Crouton to Vision OS that you hadn't considered until you did try to start using it in this virtual kitchen? Uh, there's definitely a few things that don't translate over very well, uh, which I hadn't thought about too much. Like Crouton has a sort of custom ingredient keypad mm-hmm. that you can enter with um, and a few other sort of custom uh, entry things that pop up. And on iOS, they sort of, I think they fit in pretty pretty well. But then... Yeah, on Vision OS, I think with the sort of different mode of interaction, I'm going to have to rethink potentially how those work. Will it let you do custom keyboards like an iOS? Or are you stuck with the built-in virtual keyboard? That's a good question. Uh, the ones I have in Crouton aren't actually keyboard like overrides. They're sort of custom views. So, okay. Um, yeah, I'm not actually sure about custom keyboards. I would imagine at this stage it's not something that is supported. But yeah. Yeah, something I was um, thinking about, I don't think this would actually be possible, is, uh, you know, object recognition within Crouton. So you save a certain brand of um, cinnamon that you're looking for, and it looks like this is a certain bottle, and it can recognize that and show it to you. But I don't think, is it right that you don't even get, you don't get camera access of any kind um, within third-party apps, right? Yeah, at this stage, all of the the camera feed is is locked off. Uh, they do support, um, so they call it live capture, I think, mm-hmm. might be the right term, um, which is the system thing for detecting things like emails and QR codes and things like that. Okay. But in terms of the the developer third party APIs, that's not something that's exposed, uh, which I think makes sense because obviously, you know, with your phone with the camera, you can be intentional about what you direct right. at. Um, with something that's mounted on your head, as soon as you give access, you're basically giving the developer like a 180 view. And you of, might not be aware yeah, of, of when you are actually enabling and sharing the camera versus this is just what I'm looking at versus is my camera on or not kind of thing. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And I think uh, like you meant, like dream experience would be you've got this on and then all your ingredients can be detected and it can say, okay, add the flour and it can highlight the flour and you put that in your bowl and then it knows how much you put in the bowl, tells you to stop and do the next ingredient. Right. Thing, and I think yeah. that would be that would be a great experience, but I also understand the the privacy implications of that. And so yeah. maybe Apple will come up with something in a few iterations of the SDK, but we'll just have to wait and see. Yeah, yeah, I'll be curious to see how this evolves. Um, were there any other things that you couldn't bring over because of some of the limitations within Vision OS that you don't have to deal with with an iOS? Uh, the main things at the moment, just because it's early days, is just uh, I don't have too many dependencies in Crouton. Um, but the couple that I do is obviously those developers need to, to jump on the SDK as well and add support for those. So that's sort of like, a, I guess, a, a small limitation at the moment. But otherwise, pretty much everything comes across to Crouton uh, on Vision OS. So I should be able to have, I am hope like day one at, at the very least should have a, a pretty... Um, at least feature parity from what's on iOS and macOS at the moment, uh, which is cool. Yeah, very cool. And in your mind, um, is data entry, like adding recipes, um, something for Vision OS, or is that something you'll do on the Mac or iPhone um, and then it kind of syncs over to Vision OS? Um, I know you have like a recipe importing thing from Safari. Perhaps 
is that is that possible loading up a url in safari on vision os and then saving it to to crouton on on the vision apple vision pro yeah so all of the all of the ways you can add recipes on mac os and ios will work on vision i think without trying the headset it's hard to know what manual entry will be like trying to type it or like speaking it um but the main ways people add recipes is from the web like you mentioned and that should work just fine on vision Mm -hmm. and i believe as well because you there's also uh recipe book scanning so you can take a photo of a recipe book i believe i'll be able to hopefully uh sort of hand off that capture of the photo to the phone and then pass back the photo to vision right through the photos app do the rest of it yeah yeah and maybe another another mechanism as well hopefully yeah i'll be able to do some some peering between the phone so i think yeah uh It'll be up to the user to decide which platform they find. So I often, I had a lot of recipes on my phone, but I do most of the meal planning on my Mac. And so I think right. different people are going to do what suits them, but all the options will be there. Nice. Yeah. And what's your experience has been with UI navigation with the Envision Pro? Um, I saw one of the screenshots you had with navigating step-by-step, um, kind of these big arrows to, you, I presume you look at that arrow and then you do the tap. Um is that is that kind of the best way you've seen so far? Um, do we know are like is like we know scrolling vertically is a thing. Do we know is scrolling horizontally a thing? Could you like scroll horizontally to navigate step by step as well? Yeah, I think the obviously when you're running it in the simulator, you just sort of have the cursor. So clicking simulates the sort of pinch, mm-hmm. and then scrolling, you sort of just click and drag. And so I'm pretty sure. To do that uh, with the real thing, you you sort of pinch and then move your fingers. So I'm pre- I think horizontal and vertical scrolling should work the same. And so on iOS, you can you can scroll through the steps rather than hitting the buttons if you like. And so I'm mm-hmm. hopeful that you'd be able to do the same thing, and sort of just pinch and sort of flick through the steps. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Um. And then something I just loved, I think this this got shared quite a bit online, is uh, this clever solution with, you mentioned data detectors earlier, um, or uh, lookup. Uh, I'm not sure if this is related, but uh, the ability for it to be context aware of five minutes, and then you can look at the five minutes and say pop out into its own unique timer that you can move around, put it over the toaster or whatnot. Um can, can you share a bit on, on this and, you know, um, no limitations you've found as far as you could have like five timers running and that's all running well. And, uh, what happens when these all go off and <laughs> dismissing these and <laughs> it's especially aware. It's like, yeah. a, like a grenade's gone off. <laughs> exactly. Just, <laughs> Are there sounds that go with these? Like, can you like look over and hear the timers going off at the, the microwave versus the other place? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, the timer support in Crouton, you can you can tap on ingredients in the steps and it will show you the measurements. So you don't have to jump between the ingredient list. And then, as you mentioned, you can also tap on, on any time that shows up in, in the uh, steps. So you can quickly set timers without, you know, going and doing it manually somewhere else. And so this is kind of, I guess, the first opportunity to do something that's specific to, to Vision OS where you, rather than just having a, a fixed rectangular screen, you've got you know, your room yeah. uh, to place things. And so, yeah, you can start a timer and then drag it um, to wherever you want. Maybe you just put them on the bench, but it's kind of nice if you, you know, you could position them uh, next to the food that's actually cooking. So over the pot or over the oven. Then if you've got a few going, it's easy to sort of keep track of what relates to what and saves you then entering uh, manually like a name for each timer because you can yeah. just see where it's sitting. Um, Are there names like labels to them as well? In case you uh, put it someplace you shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, at the moment it, it labels them based on the recipe and then the step that you're up to. Okay. Um, but but yeah, you could definitely add add a custom name um, if you wanted. I just think when you're cooking, you probably like most people probably only have you know two to three. A lot of the time, I only have one timer going. Yeah. And so I think you can usually you don't need a, a, a manual name to set them. Um, but I'm pretty sure as well. I haven't got to this part yet but i think i can do spatial sound so that the alarm or the the sound that goes off will mm-hmm. come from where you've placed the window uh, which neat. will be quite quite a neat experience as well yeah something i was just thinking of i'm not sure how easy this would be to configure when you're out in, in vision pro cooking but um so you have the timer for say like 10 15 minutes you know pasta i'd love a a way to have like 
a reminder every four minutes or so to stir it and make sure it's doing well. Uh, I don't know if there would be a way to like set up like an interval within the timer to say, you know, every four minutes kind of give me a soft notification. It could even like have um, a color gradient go from green to like red. And when it, you know, as a visual way to like, Oh, I should go over there and, you know, have some way to like reset it to back to green when I'm, I've attended to it. Um, that's that's just a some... pretty cool idea. Yeah. I think even on, even on iOS, that would be pretty great if you could have a timer that's sort of contextually aware of what you're cooking. Yeah. yeah like you say, it can give you a little nudge, like, Hey, maybe you should <laughs> check the oven. Yep. Your cookies might be burnt. Yeah. Cause some things um, you don't need that. Other things are much more important, um, to do that for. Yeah. Um, so that'd be kind of interesting. Yeah. Another thing, um, cause, uh, Crouton, I recently added integration for, um, there's a company called combustion that make a predictive thermometer. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I added support in Crouton. So when there's a temperature in a recipe, like for a steak, you can tap on the temperature and then connects to the probe. And then within Crouton, it'll give you the information about the temperatures and how long's left on the cook. So that's cool. That is a case where it's uh, contextually aware in a few ways. And I think that on, on vision OS would be pretty cool when you can just see sort of like a, a heads up display of, yeah, you can look, uh, you know, the oven how and far like, along oh, that's it is. How, yeah. yeah, that's neat. Yeah, that, that text always is interesting well. to me. Like, how does Bluetooth radios survive the heat of an oven? And <laughs> they do it. Yeah, it doesn't It doesn't make sense, but I, I yeah. trust the manufacturers that they've, they've tested it. So. Yeah, no, it's amazing <laughs> stuff. Um, so have you considered any 3D elements to your app? I'm not sure where this would make sense in the app, but I know that's a part of these apps that, that can be there. Yeah, that's something I'm definitely thinking about at the moment. One of the the nice things about iOS, at least since iOS 7, I think has been sort of the, the flat design that makes it pretty accessible to anyone to, to get into. The The learning curve for um, flat UI is much lower than, than 3D. And so I think now that we're almost sort of potentially stepping back into that sort of 3D more textured environment, there's a, a steeper learning curve there. And so that's something I'm just going to have to spend a bit more time sort of learning and thinking about. And Apple have... Uh, created uh, Reality Composer Pro, which is an app that lets you sort of uh, help build some of those 3D assets. Mm-hmm. Um, but at this stage, yeah, I'm still just sort of thinking about what makes sense. I think even just like a, a 3D timer element could be nice, maybe like something that actually looks like a little league timer yeah. that sort of spins around could be kind of cute. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I think as well, once we get the headset, it'll be a bit easier to tell like what makes sense to be a 3D experience right. and what makes sense to be a flat sort of you know two-dimensional one in 3D space. Yeah, some stuff will just be for sheer fun. I was thinking with pCalc, how you could have like a library of calculators so you can have a virtual, like it looks like one of your old school like graphing calculators or like a a cheap dollar calculator or even um, a little um, uh, cash register type thing that you, you'd <laughs> input it and it has this little fake paper thing that's spitting out with the calculation. on it. That would be a lot of fun. Yeah. I'm not sure how practical that stuff is, but it'd be fun. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah. not everything has to be practical. No, I mean, this stuff should be fun. So it'll be, yeah, it'll be fun to, you know, we get narrow down these kind of basics, and then from there, see uh, where we can add the fun to to different experiences. Totally. Um, anything about Vision OS um, that we haven't covered? Any? Thing, um, as far as limitations they'd like to see lifted and any, basically anything we haven't covered they'd like to before we start to wrap it up uh, I mean one kind of developer limitation at the moment is if, you're, if your app's UI kit based then there doesn't seem to be an easy path to creating the 3D mm. sort of um, uh, environments that they've shown you have to have a Swift UI foundation yeah, um, which is a little bit challenging for apps like Crouton that have been around pr- since pre-Swift UI that's kind of like oh. a a he- yeah, a heavy migration that has to happen to to flip that around. So okay, I'm, I'm kind of hopeful they might change that. Otherwise, I'll have to um, spend a bit of time shuffling things around. Yeah, that'd be a bit of work, uh, I'd imagine. Because um, yeah, I know they're very different, and some things are very easy in Swift UI. Other things are very uh, complicated and tricky to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and that, I mean that's getting better all the time. And I can also see the obviously if they're setting this up to be sort of the next computing platform for. I don't know, the next 20, 30 years, they want to start uh, with with the most modern technology now so that they're not carrying over uh, as much legacy stuff. So I can I can kind of understand it. But when you've got 
an app that uh, you've already built that you want to bring across, then it, it's a bit um, a bit unfortunate. Yeah. Um, does Vision Pro and spatial computing give you ideas for? If you start thinking of like apps that like only make sense within here, because uh, right right now we're at the stage of let's let's you know translate things to Vision OS. You know, just hypothetically, are there things that you're thinking of that are like, oh, this kind of only makes sense here, and this would be Vision OS first? Yeah, the uh, <laughs> the the only one I've started or thinking working on, which I probably will never ship, is uh, yeah. I was just thinking when you've got the headset on, it would be kind of nice just to put like some different pictures on your wall. I always yeah. get bored of like art on the wall and ha- have a hard time committing to things. And right. I'm sure everyone's thought of this idea already, but yeah, basically just. You know, you put some picture frames on the wall. You can tap on them to swap out different photos, and um, you know, move them around. Maybe even you put like some little knickknacks on your desk that are just some three D models. I think things like that would actually be as sort of silly and trivial as they sound. I think would actually be quite nice. I mean, I think that, um, and so that's yeah. pretty. I I mean, that seems pretty actually smart um, as far as like <laughs> simple idea, but like, yeah, I don't think the photos app will let you do that for say. It'll you know let you experience these 3d captures you do and you know look at them in a traditional window but like as you said putting a frame around it making it feel like a real photo i think that has potential to like for many people you must use app you know um yeah maybe you can have a few different like you know like a gold trim frame something a bit more ornate (laughs) you know suit suit yourself yeah um so I, I mean I don't know if i'll if i'll build that out but it's i've been using that just to sort of play around with reality composer and try and build a few different things so yeah because you could integrate i'd imagine like an ios you can integrate with the photos library in the photos app you have full access to the photos app within vision os apps right so yeah, yeah, yeah exactly the same so it just presents like a photo picker so the user could could choose a photo yeah and you could just pull up your favorites and that would be really cool and yeah i'm curious how good the memory is of vision pro like if i use this in the basement Will it remember that stuff when I then I use it upstairs? Remember what I had up there, and how good that memory will be as I change environments, and is it aware of where I am, or is it I'm resetting my um? If I move upstairs, do I have to like reconfigure my setup every single time? Yeah, I believe in the immersive AR experiences. It is very good at remembering the different environments and putting things back where you left them. Yeah, uh, but in the regular sort of windowed view. I think we'll just have to wait and see. Like, yeah, if you if you put something in one room and go into another one and then come back, is it always going to be where you left it? And like, as well in the simulator, if you go into a different room and then look back, you can see sort of vaguely transparent that window in the other room. Yeah. Um. So I get yeah. In real life, will it occlude the window completely until you go into that room, or will you sort of be able to look around and see those distant windows in other rooms? Yeah, because uh, I know you can reset. Like you can in all VR headsets, kind of where center is, and when you do that, it'll reposition on the windows. I'd imagine. Um, mm. So yeah, I'll be just curious to see um, the bounds of uh, <laughs> of remembering different rooms and, and things like that. Um, I know PSVR two does remember different room scans. It's do- does. Um, I'm not sure. How Apple Vision Pro is scanning rooms? There's no interface for that. It just kind of probably happens in the background. So I'm not sure. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's just magic. Yeah, it's just magic. Yeah. So I'm not sure <laughs> if it remembers uh, has a large database of your rooms that you've scanned before or whatnot. Um, yeah. Yeah, we'll just wait and see. Yeah, um, I would love um, a way to uh, try try and close virtually within Apple Vision Pro. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I'm sure that's going to be a very common thing for shopping companies to figure that one out. Um, I, you have to look at yourself yeah, in the mirror they, probably for that. I don't know. I think at the moment they don't offer full body tracking. So you'd be able to try on different gloves. Gloves, yes. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. Uh, but I'm sure that'll open up. Yeah. Uh, well, anything about Crouton we haven't touched on that you'd like to before we wrap it up? Uh, I don't think so. Just, yeah, at the moment, just really excited about bringing it across and thinking about which different experiences make sense on Vision OS. This is my first kind of, since I got into development, this is the first sort of fresh platform that's been 
announced. So it's cool to sort of be at the the beginning of something like this. And yeah, you can see how it possible. evolves year to year. That's it's always a fun thing. Um, totally. Yeah. I, I as a consumer, I like to see like I had the watch first year. It's fun to see platform just change and morph. As a developer, much evolve. much yeah. be that much more exciting. Totally. Um, we still don't know uh, about the App Store story. If like, if it'll be like Crouton is a separate app versus Universal Purchase, and um, what that story will be like. I know at the beginning of the iPad days, we had special iPad only versions of apps, and that eventually merged in the Universal apps. That's still kind of unknown at this point. Uh, I think it'll be this time around. It'll be like up to the developer. So. Uh, this is my understanding anyway, you can offer it as a universal purchase as part of um, the the rest of the, the platforms. Yeah. You, there would be nothing stopping you releasing it as a separate app as well if you, um, okay. some people still do this with, with Mac OS where they release it. Right. Sort of something with a different pricing tier yep. as a separate app. Um, but I think I think de- like definitely something Apple's done really well this time is the sort of developer story around it. They've made it very easy to bring across existing apps and just sort of the development tools and the APIs and stuff that are available. I think they've really, it seems like they've done everything they can to make sure that, you know, developers can jump on this. Nice. Uh, yeah. As quickly as possible. For for you, for you, the starting point was your iPad app. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And then you're able to like say, tr- you, it, within Xcode, you're able to say, I want to start this as Vision Pro and, were you able to start with all of your iPad code and then just tweak the iPad code and kind of morph it into Vision Native? Yeah, so there's just there's a few things which don't don't work from from the older versions of iOS on, mm-hmm. on Vision OS that they've sort of cut off, and then there's a few different then there's sort of some newer things for Vision OS. So yeah, a lot of the code just works out of the box, and then there's a little bit of uh, work after that to tweak it to make it look like a good fit on on vision yeah. so getting rid of like the solid background colors and using mm-hmm. that sort of blurred effect instead uh, yeah which I, I think if you use swift ui you get a lot more of that for free um, okay yeah with ui kit i had to do a little bit of extra work but it was still uh, uh versus completely rewriting something from scratch uh, <laughs> you know yeah <laughs> This saved me, yeah, hundreds, thousands of hours of, yeah. of work. So it's really good. And then Xcode probably warns you this bit of code that accesses the camera. Uh, you just have to take that out. Kind of like it'll warn you the different parts that are not allowed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the first first hour or so of trying to get it to build was just warnings of, yeah, this is not available. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was a, it was an exciting moment when I finally got the, the build succeeded tick and and it launched. Yeah, it seems that uh, turn by turn navigation, even for walking, will not be allowed, at least at launch. <laughs> that was one of the things not <laughs> yeah. allowed. Uh, the location. Stop encouraging people from walking out yeah. of that side with them. Venturing too far. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, so Crouton's out now for Mac, iPhone, and iPad. Is that right? Yep, that's right. It's a, a, a universal purchase. So you pay once and you can use it on all those different platforms. Very cool. And is there a website to check out? Uh, yeah, yeah. If you go to crouton.app, um, you'll be able to find links to the, the app store and a bit more information about it. Awesome. And yeah, I found you on uh, Mastodon. You're very active there, and it's fun to kind of see uh, Crouton develop uh, through some different screenshots, and um, that's been, been fun. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I like posting progress. Just sort of, I don't know, others can see the, the journey, and hopefully they can share too. I like watching other people develop, so it's nice to join in on that. Yeah, so um, that's at just me, Devin, and Massando Social, if you're curious to check you out there. And yeah, thank yep, you so much for right. your time. It's been a fun chat. Yeah, no, really great. Thanks for having me. Well, that's my discussion with Devin. My thanks to Devin for his time recording, and my thanks to you for your time and touch and tuning in. Support the podcast over patreon.com slash pros or by subscribing in Apple Podcasts. Also, if you haven't reviewed the show yet in Apple Podcasts, that would be greatly appreciated as this is a new podcast and those reviews this early on are great to have. That's all for now. I'll talk with everyone again real soon.